passes, meconium stain-like, well, that means the baby is infected. And then she goes into labor and gets deceleration, that's a lethal trial. Or a post-term, you are going to induce, there is thick meconium, and then gets a bad trace, that's not a good scenario. Or a preterm, term is IUGR, you are inducing and gets a bad trace. So a combination of these clinical features are very important to recognize. This is what was known as fetal high-risk factors compared to maternal high-risk factors. And you had to put a red dot every time you see one of these. The second one, Kesti found out, was mothers who had relative risk, mothers and babies who had relative risk. That means we are the culprit. These are mainly iatrogenic, injudicious use of oxytocin. There are two or three things one must remember about oxytocin. The process of labor is like a baby swimming from one end of the pool to the other end, 100 meter pool. So the baby goes down every 10 minutes, contraction every 10 minutes, then eight minutes, seven minutes, five minutes, three minutes, two minutes, the baby's on the other side. When you start oxytocin, you are pushing this baby under water every three minutes, every two minutes, every four minutes. So the duration of oxytocin, if it is more than eight hours, probably the baby might run into trouble if there are deceleration. So the duration for which you are going to push this baby. But more importantly, how frequent are the contractions? There are two things to this. One is the uterine sensitivity to the same dose of oxytocin increases with cervical dilatation. That means if she's contracting three or four in 10 minutes at three centimeters, when she did five or six, she'll contract five in 10, and when she's seven or eight, she'll contract six in 10. When she's fully dilated, she will contract seven in 10 if you don't reduce the dose of oxytocin. In other words, the sensitivity of the uterus to the dose, same dose of oxytocin increases with cervical dilatation. The second, the late first stage and second stage of labor, there is a reflex release of oxytocin called Ferguson reflex. When the head distends the upper vagina and the cervix, there's a reflex release and the uterine activity shoots up tremendously. So if you are using oxytocin in the late first stage and second stage, the contraction has to be monitored and the heart rate has to be monitored. If the contractions are more than four in five in 10 minutes, then you must stop it because otherwise they will get hyperstimulated. And 65% of the cases in medical litigation are linked to oxytocin. In America, it has been classed as a class B drug used in the wrong dose, wrong time. It can cause problems. The second issue is epidural in case with some compromise. Epidural is a nice thing for women to have relief in pain. In the early labor, it's much easier to give because the mother will be stable. But in the late first stage and second stage, the head has gone right into the pelvis and when you ask the mother to bend, the head jams on the pelvic floor and the uterine blood flow is from the floor of the pelvis. So if you keep the mother bent like that for eight or 10 minutes for you to give the epidural, so much of time there will reduce blood flow and it can cause bradycardia or deceleration. So you must monitor the baby in the late first stage, second stage, especially if the trace was abnormal beforehand and also in an obese mother where you can't get the heart rate properly or in a woman with previous cesarean scar, it is better to have continuous monitoring. Otherwise, you might lead to some problem. Third issue is difficult instrumental delivery, macrosomia, or malpresentation. Difficult instrumental delivery, we are talking about vacuum or forceps. If you do a bad application, the duration of application is much greater and the baby will run into trouble. In a forceps, the forceps should go just behind the eyes, across the ear, and should be pulling on the flexion point. So the sagittal suture should cut the shank of the blades perpendicularly. There should be only one finger breadth between the shank, the, the heel of the blade and the head. If it is one here and two fingers on one side, the blade has gone across the eye. So you will be compressing a much bigger diameter. And the occiput should be three centimeters. So in every note, you have to say shank perpendicularly bisecting the, the, the sagittal suture perpendicularly bisecting the shank. Occiput is three fingers above the shank and only one finger between the heel of the blade and the head. If you don't demonstrate that, then it'll be a bad application. It'll take a longer time. And although the trace was normal, the baby will be born in a bad condition. <coughs> Vacuum. 
It should be a flexing median application right in front of the occiput in the midline. If it is deflexing paramedian application, which is in front of the head near the parietal bone, you'll be pulling a larger diameter. Flexing is just in front of the vertex, so you'll be pulling through the flexion point and drawing the narrowest diameter through. So that is difficult instrumental delivery. Macrosomia refers to shoulder dystocia due to diabetes post-term, and 50% or more of the babies with shoulder dystocia are normal birth weight. You do MacRoberts manure, directed suprabibic pressure, the baby will be born. But if the baby is like a sumo wrestler, baby's chunk face and big cheeks and so on, the shoulders are likely to be big. So there is only two manures which can help you. One is called the Bangle or a Pringle manure. That is, you have to insert the whole hand, squeeze the whole hand into the posterior pelvis, open the hand, enable to push the shoulder of the sumo wrestler. You can't push with two fingers, you have to have the whole hand. If it doesn't, put the hand in and deliver the posterior arm. So instead of the biacromial diameter, you will deliver the axilloacromial diameter, which is shorter by three and a half centimeters. So those, if you have delay, they also get hypoxia and acidosis. Malpresentation refers to breach, although a lot of people do a cesarean section. The best thing to do in a breach is not to do anything till the whole baby is expelled, at least till the umbilicus, because the bitrochantric diameter is much shorter. And if you try to pull the baby before it pushes itself, the abdomen or the chest will get stuck. So there are fixed points you will intervene. If the sacral dimple is not seen, then you will try to abduct and flex the thighs. If the inferior border, the scapula is not visible, then you do the love sets with the nape of the neck, then shoulder traction and jaw flexion. So otherwise, if you intervene too early, it will run into trouble. So these are some of the cases which will run, create problems of asphyxia. The fourth point is actually acute events like cord prolapse, abruption and scar rupture has to be diagnosed clinically. You don't have to do have a CTG. When you know the woman has a previous scar, suddenly the heart rate drops. The first diagnosis, scar has ruptured. You don't have to do an ultrasound to see where the heart rate is because if it is ruptured, you have to open up anywhere whether the heart rate is present or not. If the head was three-fifths, now it's head five-fifths, then you know the scar has given way. So it's quite important. Urgency is quite important. They normally present with an acute bradycardia. Suspicious or an abnormal admission test. You are going to the home or in auscultation, if it is not going to see the baby moving, feel the baby moving, no acceleration, then that needs investigation. Now, clinically what is important is to combine these two. Post-term with thick meconium, then needs oxytocin, then needs forceps delivery, that's the problem. Or a preterm, which has rupture of membranes, don't progress, need oxytocin, then something happens. So really a combination of these features should be avoided. There is a lot of literature evidence to show growth restriction, thick meconium, uh, IUGR, etc., can give rise to metabolic acidosis very quickly. So if you want to find, you can get it. So the whole purpose of the discussion is twofold. One is actually the field reserve of the baby should be judged at the very beginning. And uh, the many instances of distress are hydrogenic, as I mentioned to you in my slides, and monitoring needs to be adjusted for each individual labor. The next concept on the Kesting report was actually the delay in taking action. The delay in taking action is because the CTG traces not all of them, but the vast majority of them can be grouped into these four categories. One is called acute distress. Usually they present with prolonged deceleration with a heart rate less than 80 beats per minute. And in 50% of the babies, the baby will drop the pH by 0 0.01 every minute, as you could see here. I'll show you some evidence later on. So here the baby has to be delivered within 15 to 30 minutes. The second is subacute distress, where the decelerations are prolonged for more than two minutes. It comes to the baseline for half the time. So for one minute at the baseline, two minutes is below the baseline. So you're dipping the baby under water for two minutes, one minute there, two minutes under. That baby has subacute hypoxic pattern. That baby will 
drop the pH of 0 0.01 every two to three minutes. The third is a long-standing hypoxia. Probably the baby is already acidotic or hypoxic before on admission. They will have no accelerations. The variability will be reduced and there will be shallow late deceleration. And uh, there are 25 percent of the babies might be already acidotic. Usually they have telltale signs like meconium infection, IUGR, post-term, etc., absent fetal <laughs> movements. So there you have to really combine the clinical picture with the trace and decide on how quickly you want to take the action. Fourth one is the one you commonly see. The baby comes with a reactive trace with accelerations. Then due to cord compression or reduced retroplacental pool of blood, it develops decelerations, either variable or late or mixed. Then the acceleration disappear because the baby doesn't move and accelerate because it wants to conserve its energy. With the hypoxia of the tissues, the baseline rate goes up due to catecholamine surge. And if it can't increase any further, and if the autonomic nervous system doesn't get enough oxygen, the baseline variability gets reduced. Once the baseline variability is reduced with decelerations for one hour, the baby will be acidotic. So you can wait for a long time. It might take two, three, four hours before that scene comes in. And you can look at the picture of the parity where the 